Summer on the Farm by John Porter. It must have been at least 115 in the shade. God only knew how hot it was on Hog Flat, where Tom Hughes trudged between rows of garbanzo beans, hoeing weeds in the mid-afternoon sun with Eddie, his younger brother. It's great to be working together, Eddie said. Ain't it, Tommy? And the humidity, Tom wondered, 90%, 95? His shirt was soaked with sweat. It had been soaked at eight this morning when he and Eddie had started working. They'd gathered eggs. Eddie had dropped about a dozen, chopped kindling, and dug a post hole. He hadn't bothered to change his shirt at noon because he and Eddie would be setting the post before they started hoeing the weeds. Ain't it? Eddie said again. Isn't it? Tom said, then glanced at Eddie, who frowned, then smiled broadly. Isn't it? Eddie said. Isn't it what? Great to be working together. Tom sighed and looked away. He would change his shirt this evening before he went to the Grange Hall for the first dance of the summer, a dance that would provide some relief from the deadly boredom of the family farm. And tomorrow we'll be working together in the barn, Eddie said. Tom sighed again. He'd be working in the barn, in the heat, in the humidity, and in the exasperating presence of his brother, who didn't know enough to be depressed by this insignificant life in a poverty-stricken, godforsaken farm in the middle of nowhere. Eddie would stay on the farm. Where could he go? He was incapable of working for anyone else. Actually, he was incapable of working for their parents, but, as they had said, he would at least avoid hurting himself. With Tom's help. With my help, Tom thought bitterly hoeing a nightshade, then a mustard weed. Well, it's going to end as soon as I can get off this farm and into some college. I'll study law, or medicine, or English literature. I'll become a lawyer, a doctor, or a professor, or maybe even the President of the United States, like William McKinley. We've just started a new century, and soon I'll start a new life. He glanced at Eddie, who was kneeling beside a garbanzo plant, brushing the leaves and smiling at them. Eddie! Tom said sharply. Eddie looked at him. These are real pretty, ain't they, Tommy? Tom closed his eyes and remembered the talk he'd had with Pa earlier in the week. Sure enough, Pa had said, get yourself over to that Friday night dance if and you wanna, but only after you and Eddie hoe them weeds in Hog Flat. What if I do half the field? Tom had asked. Can I go then? You know your brother can't do half by himself, Pa had said. Well, Tom had said, what if I do two-thirds or three-quarters of the field? All righty, Pa had said, if you do three-quarters, that's five acres, you can go. Tom opened his eyes and looked at the field. With the doubling back he'd had to do to get the weeds Eddie'd missed, he'd hoed half an acre. At this rate, he'd finish his five acres at noon tomorrow, and even if he concentrated on his work, he wouldn't finish until sunrise. He looked at Eddie who smiled at the leaves of the garbanzo plant, beside which stood a huge radish weed. Eddie! Tom shouted. Ho that radish! The big purple plant! Let's get going! Eddie jumped up. Sorry, Tommy, sorry! I'll go fast! I'll work hard! I'll I'll do anything! Anything! Anything for you! You Just tell me what you want! Tom almost shouted again, but he hesitated, then slowly smiled. He moved through the garbanzo plants and stopped beside Eddie. Eddie, he said, placing a hand on his brother's shoulder, can you keep a secret? Eddie gasped. Well, you bet I can, he said. Just tell me. And you won't tell anyone? Not never. Even Pa? Especially Pa? Not nobody, Eddie said. I promise. In the evening, Tom felt a warm breeze as he walked toward the bright lights and the lively fiddle music in the Grange Hall. He paused and tapped the toe of his left shoe on the sandy road. His floor shimes, a gift he'd given himself after harvest last fall, were a little small now, but they still looked good, and he was willing to suffer some discomfort for the sake of fashion. He suffered some more discomfort when he rolled down the sleeves of his white dress shirt and buttoned them. He came to a barn, saw a few boys and girls enter it, and continued toward the lights and the music in the hall. Maybe she'll be here tonight, he thought. He came to a big, live oak tree. Tom, someone said. 
Tom stopped, peered into the darkness, and saw Joe Brown, his best friend in school, standing near the tree. Huh, so they let you off the farm tonight, Joe said. Tom shrugged and saw Mary Jane Tompkins, who stood beside Joe. We didn't want that cider punch they got inside, she said. So we came outside for our own punch, Joe said, raising a bottle. More like a wallop, Mary Jane said. Joe offered the bottle to Tom. Maybe later, Tom said. Right now, she's here, Mary Jane said, over by the punch bowl. And not dancing yet, Joe said. Give me a wallop, Joe, Mary Jane said, reaching for the bottle. Tom continued toward the hall. He entered it. The fiddler finished with a flourish, and boys and girls applauded. Tom looked around the hall. Lucinda Simmons was the girl he'd hoped to see at the dance, and there she was, standing near the punch bowl with Allie Baker, Jeannie Harkness, and Maisie Mae Turner. Maisie Mae was beautiful, with long honey hair, rosy cheeks, and cornflower blue eyes. She was also the one who would be the least interested in Tom. Her father was rich, sophisticated, and closely associated with Harvard, from which she'd often said she'd choose her husband when the time for her marriage arrived. And anyway, she was Jed Garner's girl. Jeanie was pretty, very pretty, with bobbed brown hair and cherry lips continuously curled into a smile. Allie was also pretty, with shocking red hair and a delicately freckled face. All of them would be wonderful to dance with. But Lucinda was the one he wanted to dance with most. She was quiet and calm. Not shy, exactly, but she wasn't the kind of girl who would shout at football games or audition for the role in a school play. He took a deep breath. How could he start a conversation with her? He couldn't just walk over and say, Would you like to dance? He'd need to say something else first. It's good to see you, he could say. How are you tonight? Haven't the days been hot? He shook his head. He didn't need to say something clever. In fact, if he tried to, she would know he'd prepared a speech. But he did need to say something pleasant and respectful. He moved toward the punch bowl. Good evening, he thought. Oh, too formal. Howdy. Too casual, too folksy. I've missed you. Ooh, way too intimate, even though it was true. Allie looked at him, turned to Jeanie, and whispered. Jeanie looked at him, turned to Lucinda, and whispered. Lucinda looked at him, folded her hands, and lowered her eyes. He stopped near her. What the hell? someone shouted. Tom turned and saw Jed, who stood near Maisie May, leaning toward her, holding his fists above his head. Maisie May scowled at him, then crossed her arms and turned away. All right, then, Jed shouted, stomped toward Tom, and pushed him aside. Come on, he shouted at Lucinda, grabbing her arm and pulling her onto the dance floor. Tom took a step toward Lucinda, then saw her look up at Jed and smile. Jed said something to her. She laughed. He smirked and pulled her against his chest, and the fiddler started playing a slow, lovely melody. While Jed and Lucinda danced, Tom watched Jed's confident steps, his bold embrace, and his triumphant sneer. Tom gritted his teeth. Jed moved his hands down Lucinda's back. Lucinda leaned away, looked up at him, and widened her eyes. Jed touched her hips. She arched her back, closed her eyes, and smiled radiantly. Tom turned away. If he'd arrived earlier, he would be dancing with Lucinda now. If he hadn't stopped to think of something to say, he would be holding her now. If he hadn't moved when Jed had pushed him. He rubbed his shoulder, which ached. No, Tom thought I couldn't have done anything to stop them. Jed wanted to dance with Lucinda, and she wanted to dance with him, not me. Tom didn't blame her. Jed was big, strong, and irresistible, and Tom wasn't. Someone shrieked. Tom looked over his shoulder and saw Allie and Jeanie, who looked at him. Jeanie pointed at him, and both of them giggled. Where's Joe? Tom wondered, rubbing his shoulder again. I need his kind of wallop. Hey there, someone said. Tom turned and looked into Maisie May's cornflower blue eyes. What does a girl have to do to dance with the most handsome man in this hall? She asked. She smiled, and her teeth were so white he almost squinted. 
He stared at her. She pouted. Well, she said, do I have to ask? He opened his mouth. Well then, she said, I'll ask. Will you dance with me? She didn't wait for an answer. She took his hand and led him onto the dance floor. She put her hands on his shoulders, then pulled him close and wrapped her arms around him. She put her cheek against his. And how is Tom's summer going for him? She asked. How is it going? He asked himself. This morning I collected eggs, chopped kindling, dug a post hole, and set a post. This afternoon I hoed a few weeds, cursed my life, and planned my future. This evening I came to the hall, Lucinda broke my heart, and the most beautiful girl I've ever seen asked me to dance. And now I'm holding her, and she's just asked me a question, and I don't know how to answer it. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> Fine, he said. And, and how is Maisie May's summer going for her? She shrugged, leaned back, looked away, and narrowed her eyes. Maybe it'll be going better soon, she said. She looked at Tom, then took his hand and led him out of the hall. The air was fragrant, the music was faint but lovely, and Maisie May was absolutely gorgeous. Her long honey hair fell over her voluptuous breasts. Her gown caressed her slender thighs, and her tiny feet moved lightly as she walked in beauty like the night. Tom remembered the line from a poem he'd read in Mrs. Teague's class last year. They stopped near the big live oak tree, and she turned to him. Yeah, she said. Better soon. She leaned toward him. He closed his eyes, felt his heart explode, and leaned toward her. Maisie May, someone shouted. Where the hell are you? Tom opened his eyes. Maisie May leaned back and they saw Jed stomp out of the hall. Maisie May touched Tom's lips with her finger, grabbed his hand and pulled him around the tree. Jed stomped toward the tree, stopped and looked to his left and to his right. Damn you, he shouted. He stomped toward the barn. Maisie May giggled. Let him stew in his own juices, she whispered. Tom glanced at her and she smiled maliciously at him. He looked back at the barn and saw Jed stomp into it. Yeah, Maisie May whispered. Tom glanced at her again, then looked back at the barn. Jed came out of it snorting. He threw up his hand. To hell with you, he shouted, then stomped toward the hall. That'll teach him, Maisie May said. Tom looked at her. She clapped her hands. Now, she said, let's go to the barn, and things will be better than ever. She grabbed his hand, pulled him away from the tree, and took a step toward the barn. Tommy! Someone shouted. Tom turned and saw Eddie and Pa. Evening, miss. Tom, Pa said. Tom slowly nodded. I knowed there was doings here tonight, Pa said, and I didn't want to keep nobody from having a good old time. Tom winced. But, Pa continued, I come back from Balin and I seen the weeds wasn't hoed proper in Hog Flat. I figured you, Tom, lit out afore you'd done your portion. I asked Eddie and he said, no, you'd done it. He paused. Then Eddie demanded that we come here and ask you. Tom groaned. So, Pa continued, I'm asking, did you do your portion? If things went well with Maisie May, Tom would get into Harvard and his future would be assured. A wonderful education, a respectful profession, a beautiful wife, and an end to his time which seemed like an eternity on the poverty-stricken, godforsaken farm in the middle of nowhere. I told Pa, Tommy, Eddie said. I told him you'd done your portion. I'm right sorry, miss. Tom, Pa said, I'll take Eddie home and I'll have him do some whitewashing all by himself tomorrow if and you, Tom, tell me Eddie spoke the truth. I did, I did, I did, Eddie said. Tell him, Tommy. Oh, Tom, Maisie May said wearily. Just tell him you did whatever the hell you were supposed to do. She leaned toward him. And, she whispered, we'll go to the barn. Tom took a deep breath. If you don't tell him, she whispered again, pressing herself against him, Eddie won't be the only idiot in your family. Tom looked at her. He looked at Eddie. He looked at Pa. No, he said. I didn't do my portion. 
On what must have been the hottest day of the summer, Tom raised a fork full of chaff and pitched it into the wagon beside him in the barn, the barn on his family's farm, not the one near the Grange Hall. He pulled a bandana from his pocket and wiped the sweat from his eyes, which continued to sting anyway. He shifted his feet, blistered by the tight floor shimes he'd worn last night, now clad in lace-up manure-caked clodhoppers. "'Ain't it great to be working together, Tommy?' Eddie asked, raising a fork full of chaff, pitching it at the wagon and accidentally scattering it on the ground. When Tom and Eddie finished cleaning the barn, they would begin whitewashing it. In the sun. Tom remembered what Maisie May had said to him just before he'd left last night with Eddie and Pa. Well then, idiot, I'll get Jed, and we'll go to the barn. He imagined what had happened in that barn. Jed had huffed and puffed and... Maisie May had told him that he didn't own her and he'd better treat her right because she could always get someone else, like that little whoever he was she'd danced with. Jed had grunted. She had crossed her arms. He had grunted again and thought about mentioning Lucinda, showing Maisie May that he too could always get someone else. But he had looked into her cornflower blue eyes, thought twice, and hadn't said anything. She had pouted. He had muttered something resembling an apology for whatever he'd done to offend her, and she had smiled. Then they had kissed, groped, and torn at each other's clothing. Tom stuffed his bandana into his pocket and stuck his fork into some more chaff. His plan had been simple. He'd known that Pa would be helping the neighbors with the hay baling and wouldn't return to the family farm until dusk. He'd asked Eddie to tell Pa that he'd done his work and that he'd left for the dance. Pa would have looked at Hog Flat and suspected that Tom hadn't done his work, but he would never have gone to the dance if Eddie hadn't demanded that they go. Eddie had demanded, and they had gone, and Pa had asked Tom directly if Eddie had spoken the truth. "'Hear me, Tommy?' Eddie asked. "'It's great to be working together, ain't it?' Tom looked at Eddie, who tried to pitch another forkful of chaff into the wagon and instead scattered it on the ground again. Tom shook his head. So why had he admitted to Pa that he hadn't done his work? Eddie wouldn't have minded the punishment. Hell, he wouldn't even have known that whitewashing the barn by himself was a punishment. Ain't it, Tommy? Eddie asked. Tom sighed. Eddie frowned, then smiled. Isn't it? He shouted and smiled again. Tom smiled, too. Maybe he'd admitted that he hadn't done his work simply because he hadn't done it, or maybe because he couldn't let Eddie be punished alone, or maybe because Eddie was one of the very few genuinely loving persons he knew. Or maybe, well, he had the rest of the summer to think of the reason. Yes, Eddie, Tom said, it is great to be working together. Eddie smiled broadly. Tom raised the fork full of chaff, pitched it into the wagon, and reached for another. The End <laughs>